I'll show you the first uh, couple minutes. when I was at Notre Dame. 
like I said, I was a design major, and so with that I had a strong foundation in drawing and painting. Uh, here's some of the things I was doing uh, while I was in college. So these, it's a, it was a foundation in, in the, the basics um, that, that come into play later. Um, so photography, painting, sculpture. <coughs> One of my favorite classes was called Visual Dialogue, where we would take markers and try to make it look, uh, make an object look photoreal. But my, my time at Notre Dame didn't really have a whole lot of uh, computer. It wasn't really, the computer wasn't used uh, heavily. In fact, by the time I graduated in 96, I still had never sent an email. And my roommate at the time, he was hired as a web designer. And he had not only never designed a web page, but he had never actually been on the internet. So I, I say that just to give some context to uh, how much things have changed in less than 20 years. <clears throat> so I started teaching myself Photoshop, um, and I started doing some posters on campus for groups that were coming in, um, whether it be political speeches or concerts. And I was using Photoshop 2.5, um, which is before they even had layers. This is something that I did. I just started with a blank canvas, and I didn't have any photos. So for example, to create the clouds, I just used a smudge tool, and just moved the white and blue around until it looked um, pretty good. And then at about this time, it's a, it, in, in my trajectory, it's kind of important to mention. When I was a junior in college, I found out I was going to be a dad. So here I am, uh, senior year, with my daughter, Emma. <coughs> so this sort of, you'll see why this becomes important. I started incorporating her into all of the posters. She's kind of body surfing through the web uh, right there. Um, she's again in the clouds, and the clouds form her name. And um, she's all over this one, the reflection of the glasses. She's obviously inside there. The rocks down here spell her name. And it was just a way for me to kind of uh, create something uh, as, as the years went on to kind of use the motivation of creating artwork for her to kind of learn these new programs. So fast forward to graduation, um, I needed to send out my first demo reel. I had never you know, put one together and my work was, was pretty um, lacking at that point. So I sent out um, a 3D animation to all of the companies whose information I could find and the informational disks that existed for Google, you have to keep in mind at that point, you know, I knew that a lot of the companies were out in California, but where do you begin as far as knowing what address to send them to or any of that? So I actually don't remember how I got their addresses, but I sent out this animation um, <coughs> to them. And it's okay to laugh. <laughs> and keep in mind that my future was and that of my daughter was seemingly rested on the quality of this animation. <laughs> so I sent this out to a bunch of places in California, and I'm sure you won't be surprised why I got rejected from every one of them, but I knew that they were concentrated in California, so I moved out there without a job. And there was one company, Computer Cafe, that didn't exactly say no, so I spent about three or four weeks just pestering them until they gave me a part-time job at minimum wage. And the thing about them, they were doing some, doing some of the, the best effects of the time. They were working on movies like Armageddon and Flubber. And they also had another uh, division within the company that edited local car commercials and local spots. And unfortunately, um, that's how I got my foot in the door. And I couldn't stand editing, let alone um, use car spots. But um, that's what I had to do to start with. So every day, you know, for about a year and a half, I'd be walking by my coworkers who are doing the coolest thing with spaceships uh, launching and fire and everything, and I would be working on the worst commercials you can imagine. But what I would do is I would stay after, um, stay after work and work on the things that were interesting to me. And so here's a few um, examples of some of the things I was doing. Here I am in 1997, editing a commercial. Um, so we worked on Armageddon. Um, Here's some of the, the, the shots that I worked on for Clever. Most of you probably weren't even alive when this made you. So my job was to go through uh, frame by frame and paint highlights into the Flubber. And 
I'll show you some before and after in just a second. All right, so for example, this would be the before, after, before, after. And I actually, um, over the years, sort of kept the idea of the Where's Waldo with my daughter, and she's been on lots of commercials now and everything. And first time professionally, she was in the um, reflection of Flubber. I tried to spell her name there. So, um, so one of the things that I, I learned while I was at Computer Cafe, though, which is actually also instrumental with how my career progressed, was realizing that I was working with immensely talented people, some people who had won lots of awards, and but there didn't seem to be a clear correlation between happiness, between the people who had won lots of things and the people who hadn't. It seemed that a lot of it had more to do with the personal relationship. So that became kind of a guiding principle for me, the juxtaposition of being a dad at a young age and also having worked on you know Armageddon and, and realizing where my priorities lay. And at that point, Emma's mom and I, the relationship didn't work out. So she had moved to California, I'm sorry, to Atlanta. <coughs> And oh, sorry, I had myself. So she had moved to Atlanta, and um, so I moved to Atlanta to stay close to Emma. And I got a job at a place called Spin, and they had what was called an inferno. There was only two of them in the southeast at the time, and they were kind of the holy grail of visual effects in the mid '90s. They cost about a million dollars uh, to have the hardware and software, and, and so when I moved there, I downplayed my editing background because I didn't want to do that again. This is just some, some things you can do as you move from job to job, just downplay the things that you don't want to do and and be careful how much you embellish. But you know, I, I said I was an After Effects artist and so I got hired there as an After Effects artist, but I quickly got to work on Emma's Christmas video using the flame, and that's how I learned the flame. Every piece of software that I've learned has just been through doing these personal projects. So that's another thing just to mention that you might uh, one of the things I was frustrated with at Notre Dame was it didn't seem like they had enough offerings. You know, the, it was a traditional school, and this was also the mid-90s, so there was only um, maybe one Photoshop class, the rest of it was just traditional. And I felt kind of let down by that, but what I've come to realize is that so much of this uh, industry requires uh, self-motivated learning, and the software is changing constantly and that sort of thing. So. Um, so I learned to flame doing a lot of those personal projects, and I'm an advocate for those for two reasons, as opposed to just doing tutorials. The end product is something that is meaningful to you. And secondly, you have to work your way through it, because with all these things, you're going to stumble across um, obstacles that you can't you know, get through. You, it's not rendering or whatever, but you know, when Christmas is coming up, and you, you can't show up a day late with a video, you've got to finish it. So I highly recommend if you've got friends who are musicians, you want to do a music video, if your parents' anniversary is coming up, these are good ways to kind of uh, motivate yourself to finish a project and you're going to have to overcome whatever obstacles you run into. So um, after being there for about three years, I never led a project on the flame, but um, when I moved to New York to follow Emma, her mom moved up there. I moved up there without a job again just to stay close to her. And despite the fact that I never led a project um, in Atlanta on the flame, but didn't prohibit me from advertising myself as a flame artist. And this is another life lesson that if you do embellish your credentials, that sometimes it can catch up with you. As it did my first day in New York City when I, um, I walked in and the, the general manager of the company, um, he asked me if I knew about Dave. And I didn't know what he was talking about. He said, you don't know about Dave? And I said, no. And he said, well, you're replacing Dave, um, but he doesn't know it yet, and he'll be here in a half an hour. And when he sees you in a seat, it might be a little bit awkward. And then um, it got really uncomfortable because he thought VH1 was coming in an hour to pull a green screen on Slash from Guns N' Roses. And I'm not sure if you guys know Slash, but he's got a really frizzy hair, and that's about the hardest green screen you can pull. And unfortunately for me, none of Emma's Christmas videos had a, included green screen. So um, I was freaking out, and Dave came in, and I um, told him, I pulled the old, you know, I know how I would do a green screen, but how would you do it? And that's how I learned how to do a green screen between, <laughs> between um, that and then also taking frequent bathroom breaks with the flame manual and just speed reading and calling my boss in Atlanta. I actually fumbled through the day and survived, but 
I put this clip up here because it sort of is a good um, metaphor or analogy for my first day in New York. Uh, One second. Thank you, Doctor. Today we will be removing the patient's appendix. The first step in an operation of this particular type is. It's much funnier. Try going back a couple slides, see if Because I'm a black screen again. We'll skip the shave and go directly to the operation. The second step in an operation of this type is. Okay, so in this analogy, I am Chevy Chase. My first day. Oh, Dr. Julius Greenbaum. Thank you, Doctor. Today we will be removing the patient's appendix. The first step in an operation of this particular type is. So anyways, that was um, kind of like my first day, and it was literally me running back and forth to the bathroom trying to get through the manual. Um, but like I said, I survived, and here's actually the clip, uh, the pop-up video from that day. Pop-up, uh, uh, pop-up, video. Pop-up's a great concept. You should use it basically on everything. So it wasn't the best green screen, but it was enough to get me through, and I survived. And a lot of how I kind of survived looking back on it was just um, again, being, you know, being able to problem solve quickly and, and kind of think on your feet and adapt to circumstances that are changing that are outside of your control. Um, about two months after I started there, the lead uh, flame artist, he left, and since they had fired Dave, I became the lead flame artist at this place in New York, and it was a very... I, I made it through, and then in about 2005, I started freelancing, and I've essentially been doing that ever since. So, you know, I thought I would just take a second because to talk about the personal projects because in tandem and in parallel with my professional life, a big part of, as I mentioned before, the learning has been through the personal projects. And I'll just step through a couple of these quickly, um, starting like in 1996, just some Photoshop things for Emma. And a lot of times they were, you know, more, sometimes they're more complex, sometimes they're just real quick uh, brain sparks or experiments. Uh, when she turned six, I used the effects to add a finger for her birthday uh, card. And that sort of began the, the time where she and I each year would design her birthday cards, which was my first introduction to VFX supervision, because she'd come up with an idea and the two of us would try to figure out how to make it. She wanted to be hanging from a spoon here. Here, she wanted to be Salvador Dali. <laughs> and she wanted to have her name spell out you know, the letters, so I said it was fine, but I taught her how to cut a mat in Photoshop, so she would do all the heavy lifting on that one. <laughs> um, here, she wanted to be replicated all over the playground. And you'll see there's um, lots of parallels between what I was doing with her and what I was doing professionally, because at the same time I was doing this, I was creating all the Verizon spots, duplicating um, the test man and the Verizon network. And again, kind of like the flubber and the posters, I worked uh, them into the Verizon commercials too. Um, but in addition to the, um, you know, the, the art and the professional <laughs> aspect of these programs, you can also just use them for, for fun. I mean, sometimes for uh, like a CD cover for Emma, I may want a Bob Marley mix for her. Um, 
and sometimes I, you know, would trick my mom into thinking I shaved uh, her head. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, man baby submissions. <laughs> so, regardless of now I want to talk about the creative process, because regardless of what I'm doing, whether it's a man baby submission or something for Verizon or um, some artwork, I sort of tried to distill the process into uh, three or four main pieces. And the, the first one is to visualize. Um, the, the project I'm going to show to demonstrate this is a piece I did for my son, Andreas. Um, when um, his mom was pregnant, they seem to share a really beautiful connection in utero, and I wanted to capture that somehow. And so this, I'm using this as an example because it required a lot of pre-planning of taking pictures of her ahead of time, kind of knowing where, I wanted him to be in a fetal position, but I wanted his hand to be kind of reaching up to hers as if they were holding each other. So a lot of it, it took some planning. And of course, I, here's a, a quick one minute video showing how that came together. walk away with is just the idea that it's very, it's a good way to start a project if you already have in your mind kind of where you want to end up. I mean, you're always open to different changes, but for me, I've found that I'm least successful if I just sit down with a blank slate and just start playing with a particular or the new um, flow button or something. Um, come up with the idea in your head and just figure out how to make it. It's always somewhat amusing to me when a, a new plugin comes out that uh, within a few months, you know, six months, you'll see so many commercials that are using the exact same thing. And and so a big part of it is to customize, <coughs> customize both the plugin, but also combine it with other plugins in, in ways that aren't necessarily um, they were intended for. And to demonstrate that, the, uh, the principle of conv uh, combining conventional techniques in unconventional ways, um, I was going to show you a project that I was working on recently. And this one was um, one that I've gotten many times, which the direction is to create something that's super cool, no one's ever seen before, looks like it came from the future, something that you've never thought of. And, and this happens a lot. And you know, it's a challenge because you're, you're kind of wondering, what combination of things have I, have I just never stumbled across? Uh, and what has never occurred to me? And um, I started thinking about these 3D buildings. Um, obviously, for obvious reasons, they're typically used to create cityscapes. But if you just see them as objects, and you just start kind of looking at their shapes, they don't have to be um, just seen as buildings. So what I did was, second. My fast forward mark. So I uh, just rented out some of the simple shapes and just started exploring what I could do with them. And I started thinking of them as kind of spores on the outside of a sphere and started coming up with some pretty interesting shapes. And all this is really quick. This was, I did all these in about an hour or two hours when they were looking for some design frames. And again, it's very, you know, it's very, it just takes a little bit of tweaking of your mind, you know, as most people will have the same elements. It doesn't require a super fast computer, really expensive models. Those models were available online for free. Um, and just, you know, to make something stand out and be different, you just want to kind of look at it a little bit differently. And so another way that that can be thought of is with photography. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with stitching photos together, and you can create really neat panoramics, but you can also do that with close-up shots. And I haven't really seen other people do this, but for example, this flower, I took about 40 shots of the flower using my zoom lens from just um, 
couple inches apart, and then when I stitched them back together, the detail that I had was uh, immensely different. Or even something as similar, uh, as simple as like a, an iPhoto panoramic. Um, you know, we can all, everyone does them horizontally, but why not do them vertically? I mean, just, again, just, just tweaking what you have and not worrying too much about having the most expensive computer, but just taking what you have and tweaking it just a little bit. Um, the next part was deconstructing complexities. Uh, basically, it's kind of in tandem with the visualize, which is to have the idea, but then kind of break it down into its components and figure out what you need for each one of those components. So to demonstrate that, here is just one of the scenes I did for the Verizon crowd to show you how it comes together. So with 200 extras, I had to make it look like there was 10,000 or so. And then the final, the final part for the creative process is to experiment. And um, to demonstrate this, I recently completed a project for Castro where the client wanted fluid titanium streaks. And so what I did is, I did had, these are my favorite projects because I have no idea how I'm going to do it. And in this case, um, I typically do screen grabs every three seconds as I'm working. And then I take those frames and I convert them back into QuickTime so you can look at the, the whole process. Because I, I think it's important to, to see, sometimes you look at a tutorial <laughs> and they'll say, you know, we went A plus B and we got C. But I like to show all the wrong turns or all the whole creative process because it really does you know, require you to, to make mistakes or not necessarily mistakes, but to explore things that won't necessarily work for that project. So 99% of what I was doing on the project didn't end up in the final spot, but I put it to music. This is just about a minute of it. And, and uh, so here's some time-lapse footage of me doing this test on sociology or something completely unrelated because once you start working and popping out kids, you don't really have time to learn about those things. <laughs> um, um, and I looked real quick at NGIT, I mean, they offer classes on sociology and French. I mean, I don't know, just take a class in France and go to live in Paris for a summer or something. But now's the time to learn. So one thing I would say is obviously take care of what you need to for your career, but then be open to doing something that's completely unrelated that just sounds interesting. Um, the second thing is taking advantage of extracurricular uh, opportunities. There's obviously a catch-22 where an employer is looking for someone with experience, but you need experience um, to get that position. So 
seek out mutually beneficial opportunities. So if you want to be a logo designer, you know, approach either places on campus or, or places around town and offer to do that. If you want to be a uh, you know, poster designer, if you want to be a character animator, um, whatever your passion is, um, you can get, the advantage for them is they get their logo animated or uh, I'm not sure whether if they have a character that animated, you know, character that needs to be animated as part of their website. Um, but the advantage for you is you start developing a portfolio of professional work and then also learning how to deal with clients and revisions and you know, that sort of thing. And then the last thing is um, self-motivated learning. I mentioned before that it was kind of frustrating for me at Notre Dame feeling like, kind of like let down because I, I felt like there weren't enough classes um, that prepared me. But uh, again, a lot of I mean, keep in mind, like I was mentioning before, I didn't have um, internet when I was in college, and so I, if you guys have more than one class in Photoshop, you're already blowing away what I had in Notre Dame. So there's probably a lot more opportunities here, but regardless of this, I'm sure there's um, always, they could always improve, but it's hard to stay on top of it. I mean, the technology changes so quickly, and pretty much any software, or most of them, will be more or less obsolete within five years. So you need to kind of stay up on it, but uh, don't be, don't be too intimidated by some of these pieces either. Um, I mean, you, you, you're gonna, you're not gonna necessarily get a, a job in the industry without knowing some industry-specific software. So I'm not saying that you. I, I basically, I'm saying there needs to be a balance between the two, and and sort of an acceptance of the fact that never, everything's not gonna just be spoon-fed to you. You're gonna have. And nowadays, there's so many tutorials online, and all these programs are so deep that you you can find a very specific tutorial for exactly what you're looking for. And just to sort of demonstrate how, if any of you haven't used After Effects, but you've always wanted to, and you just felt like, oh, I don't even know where to begin, I gave my son um, a, I think it was like a five minute overview, and then I was, when I was preparing this presentation, and then he called me over, he's like, Dad, Dad, check it out. And so, this is what he showed. He just showed. did this animation. I couldn't really even help him too much. I just showed him how to get started, and he created this. Cool, buddy. <laughs> okay, so the point is, it's not the most robust animation, but yeah, he learned how to forward on the, on, you know, on the play. Yeah, you know, just don't be afraid. Don't be intimidated by these things. You know, it's not, they're not necessarily that hard. And and you know, it's like you you fear what you don't understand, and it comes with, you know, that goes across all kinds of things in life and with software as well. So, real world um, about finding the first job. One of the things I really like that Steve Jobs has said is, um, your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. When you, when you first get out of school, the first job or two you have will likely set the trajectory for the rest of your life. And you're going to be working for probably many, many years. So you want to do something that you love. And so I guess I would just encourage you to, if you're trying to decide between a few different options, um, to to go with one that maybe doesn't offer the best um, job description or maybe a little bit less money. Um, but if it's what you want to do, I would say, especially right now, go for it. Um, they, and there's a, a couple reasons why. Once, you're, once you've got your foot in the door, um, it's, even if you start off with a, just a small amount of money, like, uh, they're going to get to know you. And you know, right now you're just names on an email. But once they get to know your face and they know, oh, you got a sister, and oh, that's where I'm from too. People feel bad at this about giving you minimum wage. When that's what it was for me when I just got out, I was making about three fifty an hour. And uh, but then it went up in 1997, I think, when the national minimum wage went up to five or something. But the point is that that experience also, I got to work in Armageddon, and that just paved the way for me going forward. So. I had some other, my roommates for example, one of my roommates, um, he got a job that paid more and it was uh, doing the web design, but it's not what he really wanted to do. And he was making more money, but ultimately um, I think he would agree that he maybe should have just followed. He had another option too that was more in line with what he was doing. So, um, the next thing is, you know, prove yourself. When you, when you first get there, you might have a job description that sucks. I mean, that you might be uh, you know, getting coffee and this and that, but I would say dazzle them with whatever 
they ask you to do, but then especially if you're at a place that does what you love. Like say you're working at, I'll just I'll say it's like Pixar, an amazing company, but you're just getting copy. Well then do that for the hours they require, but then stay late and you know work on the weekends to get your to work on the projects that are interesting to you. Because the time's gonna come when the person who normally does those jobs can't come in that weekend or he's gotta go home early. Does anybody know how to do this? You know, I, I've been following him. Then that's basically the, the first time you get your uh, professional your, your real professional beginning is to, but you have to have done the, the groundwork to begin with. You need to make yourself available so you can learn that sort of thing ahead of time. Um, and, and you have to be, you know, have some degree of humility uh, with that as well. And what I mean by that is every executive producer at a New York City visual effects company that I've worked with, every single one of them started as a receptionist. So if you, if you want to uh, this, as Mark was saying before, it's kind of a, a different type of industry, and it's for sometimes you might have to just start off for the, for the very beginning in a, a position that just uh, it's you know they're not bumping you, they're not appreciating you enough um, for where you're at. I wouldn't settle. I mean, knowledge is power. You need to find out what, what you can be doing at other companies. You need to keep networking and and um, until you find the place that that you like. Um, so it's it's a combination. I mean. The other thing I would mention too is, you know, I'm talking about visual effects, and I don't know how many of you are interested in specifically in that, but even within the visual effects industry, it's a huge umbrella of different jobs. There's always, for any industry, there's a whole support network. So if you like visual effects, you're really, you know, passionate about it, but you just don't can't get your head around Maya or After Effects. Well, there's producers, there's you know, all kinds of people who are part of that structure. Not everyone in visual effects, in fact, very few of them are actually on the box doing the work. Um, and then beyond just that, you know, think about a movie like Avatar, there's going to be two or three movies still coming out, uh, sequels. Uh, they need um, all kinds of botanists to describe, to create the, the designs of the plants. They need architecture students who are going to create really cool futuristic looking habitats on these other planets. So it's, uh, there's lots of other um, sort of positions within the realm of, of visual effects. Um, and then finally, just the last sort of concept is, you know, I think ultimately the, the, the goal is to try to find some balance between following your passion and your dreams with financial realities. And um, it doesn't have to all happen at once, but if you can try to, uh, to help make that happen, to help facilitate that process, here's a few things that I've found have worked for me. One is to live below your means. Um, for me, I've always lived below my means, but a, one way to sort of quantify that is to think about if, if you live at 90% of your means, that means once every 10 years you can take a year off. I don't know why other people don't do this. It's crazy to me, because everyone, if you're making 100K, you, you, people live like they're making 105. If, you make, if you're making 30K, you live like you're making 33. Just live like you're making 27 if you're making 30, and you'll save up, and after 10 years, go live in Hawaii for a year or something. I mean, uh, life is short, so when, you, when you're living below your means, um, you, you have more flexibility when it comes to your boss saying, hey, we need you to work this weekend. And if there's someone else who's racked up a bunch of debt, they can't lose the job, you know? But if it's your kid's birthday and, you know, I already have six months now, you've asked me three weekends in a row to work, you know? You've got the flexibility to do that. So I would just say, living below your means is, I think, a key component wherever you go as far as giving you the flexibility for what you want to do with your life. The other thing I would say, mention about that too is, you don't want to put too many of your hopes into the distant future. I think a lot of people wait for, well, when I retire, I'm going to go to Greece and visit. But for now, you know, my company has this thing where if you stay with it for 25 years, then you get you know, like a, a watch or something. But when you travel to Greece when you're 72, it's completely different from when you're 27. So, you, you know, it's not going to be the same thing. So you have to always try to strike that balance between the two. Um, let's see. And then time as a currency, basically, a lot of times what I think about um, is, you know, you don't, for me, if I'm looking at a car, I don't think of it as 30,000, but I think of it as like, that's six months where I could be just hanging out, doodling, you know, <laughs> or, or hanging with my kids, or, or going with my college friends to Belize for three months. So you try to keep that balance, because, you know, having the, the happiness outside of work will make you more productive in work. And you just don't know what you're going to encounter as you're kind of following your own path. You might take that lesson in, in, Fr in French class here, then, and then go to a cafe in France and meet someone who's actually a producer at Bouffe, which is one of the big places in, 
and, and France. So um, uh, let's see. Uh, then just to kind of one last sort of balancing that out is early on in life you want to put in more hours, right? Because you want to prove yourself and, and work on the weekends and so. But ultimately you want to you want to find um, you want to find that balance. Um, and the final thing is to honor your priorities. Again and again, I found that for me that ended up working out better professionally, even when it seemed like I was shooting myself in the foot. Um, this, the, the project that sort of encapsulates all these things for me is Rebirth of Gaia. In, about, in 2008, when there was a great recession or depression or whatever, um, I lost about 50,000, or I'm sorry, 50% of my savings. And a lot of people were doubling down on, you know, I'm work hard, make more money, but I was kind of like, screw it. If someone else is going to lose all my money, I'm going to invest in myself and take some time. So I took a year and a half and I worked on this project for my daughter, Emma. And she was really into Greek mythology and her friends were kind of making fun of her. And so I wanted to do this project to sort of support her interests. So I created um, her as Gaia, the goddess of Earth. And it's actually led to a tremendous amount of um, business opportunities for me. And it wasn't my intention when I was creating it, but um, here are some stills before and after. Again, the, the pre visualization for what I was, you know, I had in my mind, I wanted her to be this waterfall. And so, and I didn't tell her what I was doing, but I'm, I'm kind of a weird dad, and so when I say lay down on the table, <laughs> she can think twice. Um, here is the final piece. Um, for my youngest daughter, I wanted to make it look like she was a nebulaic embryo, which is like, the idea was there was a nebula in the skies that was shaped like an embryo, and so I, I, I wanted it to feel like the stars were then forming kind of like the, the bones, the meat, and then became the skin, and so this is kind of a really weird looking in-between shot, but uh, so I took a picture over here, I know this looks really disgusting, <laughs> so I took a picture over here, and then I went online and I just Googled like meat textures, and then I, and, and then I created all this weird sinewy kind of knee things, and then um, the, final, the final piece looks like this. Um, and then a couple more before and after. And this is the, the last video. It's about four minutes long, and it just shows you a brief overview. Rebirth of Gaia. A brief overview. Jesse Michael Newman built a career as a visual effects artist on award-winning commercials and films. In 2006, he began a personal project for his daughter, Emma. For as long as he can remember, Emma has had a deep connection to the environment. As she grew older and became enchanted with Greek mythology, he decided to show his support for her interests by depicting her as Gaia, the goddess of Earth. Rebirth of Gaia is an organic puzzle of diverse interwoven vignettes. Peaceful, vicious, conceptual, delicate, Composed from earth, stars, vegetation, air, fire, and water. Part of this process entailed shooting photos, some of which became the principal characters, many of which, however, are more abstract like dripping honey, flowing fabric, and refractions through ice. Before taking any photos, the process always begins with an idea, with sketches. Immersing himself in Greek mythology opened Newman's eyes to a seemingly endless supply of wonderfully vivid inspiration. He took notes and drew, some drawings specific to mythology, others merely forms or ideas he found intriguing. Once he had sketched out a rough layout and choreographed attributes within this layout, he began assembling the composition digitally. The scope of the project slowly evolved from a small side project for his daughter into an all-encompassing creative undertaking spanning six years. Newman had never considered that Rebirth of Gaia would be seen outside of his daughter's bedroom and was caught off guard when some close friends wanted to purchase a print. They encouraged him to show it publicly, which he did, at the 2012 International Art Expo in New York. 
While attempting to push himself artistically through this project, Newman inadvertently created techniques that broke technological boundaries as well, including a process that allows him to work fluidly on a 300 million pixel canvas, roughly equivalent to the resolution of 150 high definition televisions stacked side by side. The reason for seeking such high resolution is simple. There is much to convey in this hyper-real, delicately interwoven tapestry. Layers upon layers of meaning derived from both the ancient narratives of Greece and Newman's own personal experience. Incredibly, because his process entails pre-composing entire scenes within scenes, the potential resolution goes well beyond this 150 HDTV analogy, since you could continue zooming into the image, finding details within the details. Shorter, 
Um, you know, I have mine is long, and I need to um, cut it down. But I would say under a minute, and I would put it up. And I'm not like a, advocating a specific website or anything. But what I use is Vimeo, and then I use Squarespace. And, um, it's pretty easy to create a website and, and just send out um, emails and kind of blank it and see what you can see what you can find out. You can even go to these different studios and um, you know humble yourself and just take a day walk around Manhattan and, and just say hey is you know I'm just I'm just graduated or I'm going to be graduating in a year or so are there any opportunities for either an internship this year or you know for you know entry job when I get out I'm really interested in character animation and and um, once you're freelancing, there's there's a few things that I've uh, techniques I've developed for increasing your rate, and and that is, I want first off I wouldn't I, I would when you're first working with one particular company they're they're gonna try to talk you down, you know as low as possible for your rate, and if you haven't worked with them before, um, I would say you know for the for one week or two weeks just whatever it, it, it's almost it's worth it to have that connection in in the real world experience. But then after that, once they see you know who you are and get to work with you, then I would say, okay, you just make it clear. This is a one-time thing. You know, I'll give you 50% you know, off what I would normally. But then um, once you establish kind of what your rate is, you, you can always increase it pretty easily. And the way you, the way you do that is you have a couple of companies, and you say your your rate is um, I don't know, say it's like 30 an hour, and then you want to increase it to 40. So you you tell you know. Three or four of them is thirty, and then you tell someone else who calls, you know, a new one, say it's forty or something. And once you get enough people who are paying you forty, then when these people call you again, you say, oh, I've increased it to forty, and they say, oh, you know, we wanted to keep it at thirty, and say, okay, well, you can, we can keep doing thirty, and if nothing else comes in, I've got nothing going on, then yeah, sure, thirty or whatever that number is, is great. It's better than nothing, but you know, I can't give you a first hold. And real quick, for freelancers, the way the first hold works is. If somebody wants you to work with them, they'll request a, a first hold so that if you know someone's going on vacation in August, they want you to cover them. They'll say, "Can we have a first hold?" All right, and then that's company A. If company B calls and say, "We want to hold you for that week in August," and you say, "Okay, but I already have a first hold. I can give you a second hold." Now you can challenge them, but you have to give the the, the first people um, the right to refusal, essentially. That um, so. So yeah, I would just basically um, start off humble, and then just prove yourself when you get you know in the door, and then you can start commanding more and more. Is that answer? Oh yeah. Okay. More than I'm looking for. Thanks. Um, yeah. Oh. I actually have a question about Rebirth of Gaia in the video. They, you mentioned they they mentioned a technique on how to work on them. Seems to me to be a really big canvas. Uh -huh. So, um, yeah, that was actually Adobe was asking me about that too because it's um, you know After Effects is predominantly for video, so they they are doing um, most of their clients are working at 1920 by 1080 uh, or even 2K or 4K, um, and I was doing this in 2007 and I was working at 30K, so they were thinking of me as like a guinea pig, and the way. There's a couple ways to do that. Uh, first off, the reason why I was using After Effects instead of Photoshop, I wouldn't have been able to do Rebirth of Gaia in Photoshop, I don't think, because, for example, and I know some things have changed over the years, but in Photoshop, if you've got a layer, and you duplicate it in five megabytes, it becomes 10 megabytes, and it becomes 15 megabytes. And After Effects is just referencing the original file. So you can duplicate it 100 times, and it's, the After Effects file is going to be 100K or something. And the other reason I, I use After Effects is because you can pre-compose, you know, I can work on the waterfall, and I could, you know, finish the waterfall, which is down here, and save that up as just one layer. And then for the final composition, you know, it just becomes way one layer as opposed to every single animal. Um, and, uh, and probably the most important reason for me was the fact that working in After Effects is more like oils versus acrylics. You can come back to it a year later, and if something is blurred too much, or the glow is too hot, you can tweak it with fresh eyes, whereas um, a lot of times in Photoshop, and I know things have changed uh, over the years since it started, but uh, it, it becomes more baked into it. And unless you take meticulous notes of, you know, I blurred that 112 and layer two was layer six, um, it's much more difficult to work that way. Uh, and then finally, when you're working in After Effects, you can work in proxy. I haven't actually, um, I haven't really worked with, yeah, in fact, 
Uh, Mark knows more about VR than most people in the industry. When he was, when I worked with him at Entropic, he was educating all of us about the possibilities of VR. I mean, all these things are, the technology's always changing. So I, you know, a lot of these paths are kind of worn down at this, not worn, I should say worn down, but um, are, have been well-traveled, you know, on the flame compositing after effects. But VR is one, I mean, 3D printing, I don't know anything about either of those things. And you know, so if you learn some of these new technologies, uh, you know, just saying, kind of like when I moved to Atlanta or to New York and kind of lied that I knew After Effects and I knew Flame, um, that got my foot in the door real quickly. In much the same way, you know, if you if you could spend some time knowing, learning about VR, and uh, again, so much of this uh, technology is accessible with YouTube, and, and uh, you know, that if you're interested in just, if they, if they don't have a class here in VR, just supplement your own knowledge with what you can find online. Yeah. Um, hey, so um, uh, for you as a compositor, it makes sense to show off like the final image and the final shot, the final commercial. But for three D modelers, their job kind of ends like before <laughs> the final steps. Uh -huh. In a portfolio, would it make sense to show off what exactly you modeled and made, or the final piece as it is? Well, the most important would be what you modeled and made. I mean, because um, one thing people are, I mean, people are aware of. You know what you have access to, right? And and so, for example, I mean, sometimes you have to be creative about getting, you know, cheap models. Like I did a video copilot. All those buildings were from video copilot, and they're free. You just download them. So um, that might be a little bit of a tangent. The the, the point is, what they're going to be. If you want to be a three D modeler and be seen that way, the most important thing would be to show what you can model. And um, you know, if you if you are able to to write it. In a nice way that's even better, but I think even a simple you know lighting uh, lighting package with you know just a shadow on the ground plan or something, if that's what you're that's the most important part. They understand, especially with with the 3D component of visual effects, it's very um, what's the word like kind of broken down into very specific parts. Uh, you know, you've got the first person who does the sketches, and then uh, someone does the model and the rigging, and then. Um, animating and then the lighting and, and then it comes to the compositing. Um, so people who are in the industry, they'll know. They won't be expecting Fear Modeler to see anything moving. You know, uh, if you want to be a generalist, then it might be good to have a couple different sections. But if you just want to be a modeler, then it should be fine. Okay. What do you think? What What do you feel like the difference between uh, going from like movie commercial like, um, animations, character animations? Yeah. Um, let's see. I, you know, I don't, I don't have this much experience recently with movies on the, on the character animation side, um, so I don't want to misspeak on that. I, just generally speaking, um, you know, the, the movies will be a lot more involved. So, for example, um, one of the things I like about commercials is that it was kind of changing, it changes every two or three weeks. But with the movies, like for Flubber, it's eight months of painting green goo. So, in, in much the same way, on a movie, you, you might be working on the next Gollum or something, but that's um, what you'll be doing for a quarter of a decade. You know? So, it, I think it depends, um, you know, uh, what you're interested in. I mean, yeah, they, they, they use a lot of the same techniques. I mean, even Gaia, this print work, it's everything that I'm doing is using the same um, paintbrush, you know, of After Effects. Um, but so a lot of everything's going to translate well. If you can, if you can animate, you know, for commercial, it'll translate to a movie. It's just a lot of it depends on how um, how long you want to be on a project. And a lot of a lot of movie work uh, it depends also geographically where you want to live. A lot, a lot of movie work is going out of the United States, and there's more advertising commercial work in New York. Um, Los Angeles, you know, obviously still has um, movie work, but a lot of it's moving to Toronto and, and overseas as well. So um, just keep that in mind. I don't know what the latest you know, trends are, but it's just something to keep in mind that there might be more options um, here domestically for commercial work. But obviously, you know, there's Blue Sky in New York. And, and I'm working on a movie now. Um, just through, uh, actually through um, Rebirth of Gaia, 
um, got me to know working on the movie. It's a Chinese movie, um, and and so it's not impossible to work. Um, just wondering, approximately how long did it take you to actually find a place to settle down and live? Because it sounds like the early days of being an animator VFX artist are almost kind of nomadic, like you're moving from one job to the next and trying to yeah. like, find where you belong. <laughs> yeah, as far as, um, as far as geographically or as far as the company? Uh, I guess kind of both. Okay. Interesting to know both. Well, for me, geographically, you know, a lot of it was me following my daughter, so that's, um, and she just went to college a couple years ago, so, um, so that, that kind of, but obviously that's not typical. Um, uh, but if you're looking for some motivation, um, you might want to have a kid, and I'm joking. <laughs> um, but, so geographically, you know, I think there are places that have a lot of work and a lot of concentration of different companies. So New York obviously is one of them, and Chicago, Los Angeles. Um, you know, if you move to Philly, or I don't really know how many places are in Philly, but I imagine it's quite a few less than in New York. So when you're starting off, it might be helpful to work at a place that has a lot of different options. Um, I, I like feel like a lot of people are usually talk about the West Coast, and I can't tell if that's just really typical of people to say, oh, you can go out west, there's lots there, or if, yeah, I mean, it's, honestly, I, I love the West Coast, so if, uh, if I had moved there, it's where I would be, but, That's um, but, you know, I think at this point when you're first starting, I don't know if it really matters too much. I mean, if you have anyone like Mark who's in the industry who, <laughs> Mark, I'm going to keep plugging you. Everyone's going to walk away with Mark's business card for you. Um, then you might... As far as moving around from company to company, it depends. I mean, if you're at a place that allows you to do a lot of different things and it's it's what you want to be doing, then like, like I was saying before, I would stay there as long as as long as you can. I mean, if you're happy there. Um, but if you feel like you're being pigeonholed and you're not given the sort of jobs that that you would like to do, one, I would communicate that you know to them because maybe they just don't know that you don't like doing that. But um, you know, and especially if you're working on your own after hours and you know, you're, you're doing the stuff you want but then they never actually give you those jobs, then I would, I would feel free to, to move around I mean, um, and communicate. One, once you work at one place, get your foot in the door, you're going to be sitting next to three other animators, right? Hey, where did you work last? Oh, you, know, what's your, you, know, you guys are going to have to email each other the setups, you know, here's the FBX sequence. Then you got their email, hey man, what have you been up to? Where have you been working recently? And then, so I think once you just get you know, your foot in the door, it just starts, um, you know, you're sowing seeds for future opportunities. I don't know if that answered your question. So oh, I know it answered it. Makes sense. Okay. Yes? Jesse, I feel like as, as students, sometimes we approach each project as it, it's, it needs to be a new entity. We have to start with a fresh slate. And when you were showing the compressed breakdown, I don't know if it was the castrol, just your working process, and hearing you talk about your personal projects, it sounds like you're constantly developing looks and techniques and methods that can be rolled out and repurposed later in the future that you can call back so that not everything needs to be a fresh start. And I wonder if, if that's true or if you could speak to that, because sure. sometimes we struggle with that in school. Yeah, yeah. Well, on a basic level, and it's one thing I forgot to mention before, and that is uh, I think in whatever in whatever platform you're, you're doing, if you're, if you're using Maya, if you're using After Effects, some afternoon, just go through every single plugin to see what's options, what, what the options are. But then just file it in your mind, you know, and so you can take it back at some point later when the project presents itself. In much the same way, like those presets, if you develop these techniques, um, they might not be appropriate for the project that you're working on. And so the ability to recall um, them will come in handy. Something just happened recently. Um, 
Well, for the Castro video, I just got a call last week for someone for a video game company that wanted something similar to that. And because I'd already done a lot of the R&D for it, you know, I, I have the setups. And because that's the setup is, is um, obviously highly customizable based on the, the motion of the person who's casting the, the streaks and, and it, di it distorts the background, so it actually won't necessarily look like lift. I mean, I try not to, to just, um, you know, replicate anything straight out of the box, but I do find that, you know, it's like a constant, uh, it's like a soup, you know, you're constantly taking a little piece from this and a little piece from that, and you can definitely build on those experiences. For anytime I have an After Effects setup that, that I know I would want to use in the future, like it might be some Verizon streaks or something like that, I'll, I'll save it in my resources folder so that I can, you know, call it real quick. And, and you, because, honestly, I forget, I'm not, I don't have the best memory, and so I forget, like, how the heck did I do that one? And so it's good to be able to just open it back up and, and, um, and scratch my head for a few minutes until I figure it out. But, um, so yeah, I don't think you need to reinvent the wheel every time. Um, but you know, before you can even start to design the first wheel, you need to know what the options are. And, and like I was saying before, once you know what these plugins are, you might find one that's super cool, one that's like um, you know, 3D stroke and trap code or something. But but then I wouldn't I wouldn't start up a project just sitting down, you know, ready to go, opening up a layer, put 3D stroke on it, and just see what happens. I think just remember what 3D stroke can do. And then maybe five years from now, a client's going to say, yeah, we're looking for some streaks that go back and forth. And, oh, yeah. So, you know, I, I think it's good to build upon what you've done and, and, and try to, in your own way, keep track of what these techniques are. For me, I save, I, I pare down the After Effects file when I'm done with the project, and I save just the setup as, you know, Verizon streaks or, you know, um, Castrol or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so you said doing all of your own work is good, and it Um, I would say that the, you know, your professional career is pretty much going to be people telling you what to do. <laughs> so now is the time, uh, you know, to just see where you can go. I mean, you know, you, you have no really, in, in the scenario you described, you really don't have any outside parameters that are forcing you, you know, the colors this year, everyone like, wants to use, you know, blue and purple, so keep it in that spectrum, but we want to have sharp ones. I mean, you're going to be hearing that a lot. I think if you, I think at this point, I would, I would say, you know, be aware of what, you know, and maybe do one or two things that sort of speak to what's what you think the client might might want, you know, a potential employer. But I I would really um, advocate for finding your own your own vision at this point because people may not have seen, they may not know that that's an option because it's coming from you, you know. And that's the beauty about these these um, these programs. I mean, they, you can translate your your vision so quickly and easily that um, you might not have seen that that have been executed before, but that's just because you just have never done it. Maybe once you do it, someone's going to fall in love with it and you're going to get hired for that. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, at this point, I wouldn't focus too much on trying to second guess the client, you know, because there's so many different books out there. I would really find your own vision and, and at least start there. If you see that nobody, you know, likes it or it's not going anywhere, then, then start building up some other things as well. But um, but whatever you do in life, I would say to keep that balance. So even if you're hired professionally to be an animator and all you're doing is Dunkin' Donut commercials and you're the one who's known for doing the $9.99 per month or whatever, I don't know. Even if that's what you're paid for, I think it's good to have a vibrant um, you know, personal project life where you can you know, just leave that alone. It doesn't have to necessarily be animation, it can be anything at once, but you know, that's what kind of keeps the creative juices flowing. Um, I know one of the main things that's going to help you stand out is, um, you know, finding your own personal art style. So, well, basically two questions. Like, what would you say your personal art style is, and how do you, um, how do you go about realizing what that art style to you is? Well, I mean, I think this is the culmination, really, of my art style, and that is blending a lot of um, sort of different elements. and. Um, you know, there's a lot of different vignettes within here, a lot of stories, a lot of mythology that's um, being described. Um, and I've kind of always been attracted to the sort of things where, you know, you see 
you, see, you have a picture of two bases, but it's also, I'm sorry, one base, but it's also two faces, just to be able to look at, you know, one image, but two different ways. I've always been interested in that sort of thing. So, for example, my daughter here is the tree climbing up, and then there's also the two eyes up there, and uh, the mouth made out of the tree, and, you know, the hills, obviously. And, um, so I, I would say this is a pretty good example of what I gravitate toward. I don't get a lot of um, clients asking me to turn my kids into landscape, so I had to do that on my own. Um, but, and so then as far as realizing it, you know, just came down to taking the time to um, allowing myself the time and the space to kind of let it unfold. Um, the waterfall section here took me just about four months. And that was four months every day just sitting down for 10 hours a day working on it. So, um, so to allow your vision to unfold, whatever you end up doing, I would just say just, you know, don't max out your credit cards. Keep things flexible so you can have time for yourself and take, you know, a few weeks or a few years or whatever it is just to do your own, your own thing. So, like, one of the issues I have as a student is that I can't decide what I want to do once I get out of here. So, uh, I just decided to become, like, a jack of all trade, or trades, right? But, like, and there's a saying, a jack of all trades, but master of none. So, do you think it's best to market yourself as being able to do a number of different things? Or should you just try and, like, specialize and become really good at one specific thing? Honestly, it doesn't make a difference because there's lots of jobs for generalists and there's lots of jobs for specific. So if you if you can't decide, then I wouldn't force yourself to arbitrarily pick, you know, I want to be a lighter or I want to, you know, I want to focus on lighting or, or rigging or animating. I would say um, if you're not sure what you want to do and you kind of like doing lots of things, lot, there's um, many freelancers do that. I mean, they, they call, they're called in for a project that maybe doesn't require the, you know, the specialty of, of each person along that chain. Um, and they might not have the budget to hire five different people, the modeler, and the, you know, the, the animator, et cetera. And so there's lots of opportunities for generalists as well. And then even in the process of, of learning more about each of those, you might discover which one you are gravitating toward. But if you're not feeling pulled one way or the other right now, I wouldn't force it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, uh, so have you ever used flat painting? And if you did, I would imagine, let's say this 30K image, like on a matte painting, with every single layer moving it by itself, what images, well, you would distort them. Um, so it would give it some kind of life into it. So have you ever went to that? Like uh, brought it to life? Like yeah, like matte painting in After Effects. Uh, well, when you say use matte painting, what do you use? Matte painting is basically uh, cutting up images and uh, Displacing them in the Z direction, and so they get like a 3D uh, um, element to it, and yeah. then you distort the um, pictures itself to give them life. Whether it's like tweaking the leaves or like uh, making the water flow, or um, playing with the aperture for zoom, um, giving some movements, something like that. Yeah, actually, I I have uh, um, several pieces of this that I've, I've sort of started doing that with. Um, it's just uh, hours in a day to really make it happen, but um, yeah, I mean, there's you know, there's this one part of the waterfall, I'm not sure if it even comes out if I have it on here or not, but um, where at the very end of it, I, I pull out from inside of the tree and you, know, you see the parallax because that had it on different layers and that sort of thing, so yeah, I mean, I think I, I would like to bring some of these to life just need to duplicate me. <laughs> All right. November 20th um, at 4, we're going to be going to 